Welcome. Today we, we recognize the third Sunday of the Advent season, a time when, when Christians celebrate the, the incarnation, when, when God became man through, through Jesus Christ, whose, whose birth we, we celebrate. It's also a time when, just as, as we look back on, on that singular moment, when the Son of God shattered that barrier that, that had existed between, between God and man by arriving in the form of an infant, we also look forward to the second arrival of the Son of God, not, not as an infant anymore, but in, in full glory as the King of kings and the, the Lord of lords. Even, even in this time of COVID that we're experiencing right now, Christmas is, is, is everywhere. Uh, the malls, while not, not as crowded as, as they normally would be, there are still throngs of people out doing last-minute shopping. The restaurants, uh, unfortunately, at the, at, at the time I'm recording this, are, are empty inside, but people are, are huddling outside around heaters and enjoying each other's company. Um, the, the lights are, are up everywhere. Tree sales, uh, I've been told, are at an all-time high this year. Uh, and the post office is actually uh, b- bending under a record number of Christmas card deliveries as people are reaching out more and more. The music of the season is taking over the airwaves now, and, and as the old song goes, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I grew up hating Christmas. I was Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch rolled up in one. So I was proud many, many years ago. I was proud of my young daughter when um, she was sitting in a uh, the little seat on the back of the cart and we were in a, in a supermarket somewhere and a, and, a, and a sweet, sweet elderly clerk leaned over the counter and looked at my daughter and said, um, you know, so, little girl, what is Santa bringing you for Christmas? And without missing a beat, and it, with that steely look that my daughter still has, she looked at this woman and she says, we don't celebrate Christmas, it's pagan. And she said that loudly enough that pretty much everybody else around us uh, had to turn over and look. Looking back on that, I have to be honest, um, I was proud of her at the time. The words Merry Christmas were a, were a slap in, in, in my face. I understood um, that, that the people's heart was in the right place, that they were, they were either just really genuinely wishing me a Merry Christmas or they were just simply going through the motions of the season. But I just thought if, if only they understood the truth. And I have to wonder now how many good, loving people looked at at me back in those days and said to themselves, boy, if only he understood the truth. Back then, my reply was simply, bah humbug. But now I do understand. And and to be honest, I'm um, I'm still Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch and proud of it. But I'm Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch at the end of each of those respective stories. The final line of A Christmas Carol is, And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. And as for the mean Mr. Grinch, and what happened then? Well, in Hoopville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. Yeah, I'm good good with being... Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch now. Christmas is just around the corner, but there are places in in Whoville where there is no joy. People are struggling these days. Many have not worked in months. Families are facing eviction. And many people simply don't have the resources to purchase gifts, uh, to put up the decorations, to, to go and visit the family, to do the meals. And that just brings their lack into this sharp contrast with, with those that, that, that are doing better during this season. Some people have experienced loss, and Christmas reminds them of uh, deceased loved ones. There's an episode of the TV series many years ago, MASH, uh, Mobile Army Hospital, um, 
one of the one of the greatest shows in my opinion on on TV certainly one of the most watched in its day and they would try to take on some of the um, some of the the issues of, of, of the time but it, there was one episode where they took on a familiar issue of the season a, a, an American soldier during a, a s- Christmas ceasefire in Korea which turned out to not be a ceasefire was brought into the MASH unit and and the doctors and the nurses knew that that there was no chance of him surviving that his injuries were simply so severe but they worked and did everything that they could to try to keep this young soldier alive until midnight on Christmas Day simply because they knew that that if he were to die on Christmas it would it would have a long lasting effect on on his family back in the states and so they did everything they could so that that it was just shortly after the stroke of midnight that they stopped all of their life support and allowed him to pass away many people feel the loss of a loved one around this season this year families are being encouraged not to travel seniors living in retirement and assisted living centers have been isolated and alone for months now Uh, And Christmas is only going to magnify that loneliness, that isolation. North of where I live, caring people have been delivering Christmas decorations and just strands of of colorful garland um, to uh, many of the homeless camps that we see springing up all over the area these days. Just so um, an individual or a a family living in a tent covered with a blue tarp in, in the middle of winter can have just a little color, just a little hint of the joy of the season. Because it's so easy to ignore these people, to, to pretend that they don't exist, to, to sing along with the carols on the radio, to watch White Christmas and It's a Wonderful Life for the 30th time. Um, it's just too easy to avert our eyes from those in despair, those that are lonely, those that are struggling, um, and to cover our ears so that we can't hear their cries. Is this really what it means to celebrate Advent, to focus on the good, and to ignore the bad? Of course not. Advent should cause us rather to seek those who are struggling, to seek those who are experiencing loss, to seek those who are, who are struggling for even the, the slightest hint of joy. This season should compel us to reach out to those pushed to the very margins of existence, the very margins of our society. So let's look at, the, at, at, at Scripture today. Let's see what the Lord has to say about this. Um, here's the, the text of, of our day. And we are going to be in perhaps not necessarily the passage that you would expect for the Advent season, for the Christmas season. We're going to be back in Isaiah, and we'll be reading in Isaiah 61, starting in verse 4. And then we will be jumping down a few verses and continuing to read. Here is the word for the day. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and, to re- and release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. And they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Jumping down a few verses. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. And all who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels 
For as the soil makes the sprout come up and garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. In this beautiful passage, Isaiah the prophet reported the words of the Messiah, the appointed one, the anointed one of the Lord, given to a people that were returning, returning from exile, returning back to nothing. Um, Cyrus the, the Persian had, had united the Persian and the Median armies and, and kingdoms together. He had conquered the Babylonian kingdom in, in 539. And, and in 538, it, you know, he, he, he issues this decree allowing the Israelites to return back to their homeland, to return back to, to Jerusalem, to return back to all that the Babylonian armies had destroyed. They come back to nothing. If you could imagine Syrian refugees returning back to cities that had been ravaged and destroyed during the war and, and coming back with, with the goal and the desire to rebuild, but having really very little to even, to, to even do that. That's where we find the Israelites these people didn't know what the future held. Their way of life had been lost. Um, they had lost touch with their very identity over these long periods of time in captivity. They believed that they had lost everything. They were people that were just, they were simply overwhelmed by poverty, brokenness, and despair. And in the midst of this, Isaiah wrote a message of hope to his audience. He let them know that the, the Messiah, the anointed one of the Lord, would, would fix everything that was broken. God would not overlook and ignore their suffering, and, and one day he would actually dispel their despair. The Messiah's restoration would be personal, and it would be complete. God would not only restore his people collectively, but he would restore them individually no matter what the state they found themselves in. He would leave nothing undone, and you have to believe this was incredibly great news to a people who, who had nothing. But the immediate question, the immediate question, the obvious question would be, yeah, yeah, you're going to do this, you're going to give us this, you've got these incredible promises that we just heard. When? When? How soon? How soon do we get that? Tell a child that if he does his homework and gets good grades, he's going to get a bicycle. And then watch him ask you every day, when, when, when do I get my bike? When do I get my bike? When do I get my bike? Tell an employee that if they keep doing a good job, that they're going to get a, they're going to get a raise, they're going to get a promotion. Um, when? When? Congress talks about stimulus checks and unemployment relief, and the American people are going, okay, yeah, yep, good idea. But when? When? See, these people had heard promises before. And they knew God's timeline is not always our timeline. They may have recalled a similar promise back in 2 Chronicles 7.14, one that we're very familiar with. That if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn their wick from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That was a beautiful, beautiful promise that took 70 years to actually come to pass. God does not always do things in the time frame that we expect him to do. So this, this message about this Messiah was good news, but they wanted to know when their poverty, when their brokenness, and their despair would cease. More than a half a millennium later, a young teacher went into a synagogue back in, his, in, his, in, his, in the town of his birth, of, or town, his hometown of Nazareth. He took the, uh, the scroll of, of Isaiah the prophet down from the, the cabinets where they kept such things, and, and he, he laid it out on the altar and, and let it slip into the little grooves so that it, it would stay. And he stood, and in a clear voice, he recited the first two verses of the passage that we just read, the scripture passage from Isaiah. He, he expertly wove in another passage from Isaiah just, just to deepen his message. He left out the day of vengeance part because that's for another advent. 
But like a master orator, this young rabbi sat down and, and, and he paused. And, and these are the people, these are the descendants of, of Isaiah's audience. Um, they were used to empty sermons uh, that really did more for the speaker than did for the people. They were used to empty words. They were used to broken promises. They were used to restoration that really never really felt like restoration. It never felt complete. These were the ones who still carried the, the bits of the poverty, of the brokenness, and the despair of their ancestors um, as they live here in, in captivity, now in Roman occupation, not as bad as the Babylonians, but still, they're not a, a truly free people. This rabbi, though, however, seemed to be different. And in words that blended confidence and compassion, the rabbi then said, today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. See, this account of, of an event early in the ministry of Jesus is captured in, in Luke 4, 16 through 21. Luke lets us know that, that at long last there was an answer to that question. How long? When? That day in Nazareth, Jesus declared that he was the beginning of the end of poverty. He was the beginning of the end of brokenness. He was the beginning of the end of, of, of captivity, of slavery. He was the beginning of a new era of grace and that this new beginning started today. Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection brought restoration not only for Israel but for all humanity and, and Jesus brings restoration to us today. And this is good news for humanity. It's good news for each and every one of us. In one way or another, we're all poor. We're all broken at some level. We all have reason to despair. We all suffer. We are all in need of, of restoration and redemption. At one point or another, each and every one of us have, have, have cried out, Lord, how long? How long? Suffering is part of the human condition. Christians, those who have experienced the, the newness of, of, of life that can only be found in Jesus, really, I mean, we of all people should be filled with compassion. Our hearts should, should turn towards those who are, who are hurting around us. We should not avert our eyes, cover our ears, stay silent when we see the, the, the pain, the loss, the loneliness, the anguish, the deprivation around us. Since we have been restored in Christ, we should be the first to proclaim that Jesus has come to give a new beginning and that there is, there's not a hurt that he cannot heal. There was no one lost that, that Jesus can't find. There is absolutely nothing broken that he can't fix. Now that's not to say that, that, uh, that we start following Christ, our lives become easier. Jesus is not the magic wand that makes our problems go away. Jesus, following Jesus does not change our circumstances. It changes us and how we deal with those circumstances. Jesus causes us to see the world differently. We, we see the world through the lens of, of, of the life-giving cross. We see ourselves as loved and accepted by God. And, and we see others, others as loved and accepted by God, regardless of their state. This enables us to love others because they are made, just as we are, in Mago Dei, in the image of God. And we have a purpose in Christ. And we have a work in Christ in which to, we get to participate with Jesus Christ through the workings and indwellings of the Holy Spirit. Because of Christ, we can find hope, we can find peace, we can find joy, and we can find love. All things we celebrate in this Advent season, and we can find those in any circumstance. And, and for Christ's sake, we do not want to keep this good news to ourselves. Verse 3 of Isaiah 61 says this of the Messiah. It said the Messiah will, the anointed one, will provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. 
Here Isaiah, he provides us with directions leading to participation in Jesus' work uh, to restore and to redeem. As I said, provide those who grieve in Zion. Marie Antoinette was famous um, for uh, an expression as the people um, of, of France were in essence starving because the aristocracy um, made some bad decisions. Um, they bought up all of the wheat. Bread was, was, people were fighting over a loaf of bread, stealing a loaf of bread. Starvation was rampant. And Marie Antoinette was confronted with this. And because she was so insulated from the people that she just simply didn't understand their plight and didn't even really understand what was going on, when she was told that the people were, were, were starving because they could not buy or make bread, she supposedly has responded back, well, if they can't eat bread, then let them eat cake. Just a totally clueless, clueless response. But we kind of do the same thing these days. There's another shooting in a school. There's a tornado that takes out a town. Um, there's there's um, any number of natural disasters or man-made catastrophes. And, and what's the best we often do? Well, our, our thoughts and our prayers are with you. Now, yeah. We want thoughts. We want prayers. There's power in prayer. But too often we only pray for those who, who suffer when really we should be providing while we pray. But we should also try to avoid the mistake Christians often make when they provide for those who are struggling with what they believe is needed instead of what the people actually need. We need to, as, as the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ, we need to engage with people in our community and find out from them how we can be a blessing to them. I will see that with people working with, with the homeless, and they will, they will come out and they'll give these food baskets full of, of canned goods and, and ingredients, thinking that they are doing some wonderful thing, presenting these to somebody in a homeless camp without it even occurring to them that these people have no mechanism to cook. They have no way to prepare. And this stuff simply goes to waste because there's nothing they can do with it. We need to, we need to engage the community. Uh, and this can be done directly with people in need, <coughs> excuse me, through conversations, or by forming relationships, Joining hands with charities and, and community-based organizations who specialize in, in serving a particular people group. Not just to simply hand the responsibility over to them, which is so tempting. We'll come along, we'll give you funding, but you go out and you take care of them. But to, to turn to them and say, okay, what are you doing and what can we do? How can we participate so that that good news of the gospel is presented and not just a handout of, of food or, or aid. One way or another, our giving should always be grounded in relationship. The passage says to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. It is way, way too far easy for people to confuse their circumstances with their identity. For example, our, our momentary loneliness can easily turn into the narrative that we're unloved. And those two are, are totally unrelated. But too often we allow our situation, we allow our upbringing, we allow our, 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 our well-being, of whether we're in poverty or even if, we're, even if we're rich, we allow those to begin to determine what our identity is of how we, we think and how we act and how we react. Now, there's, a, there's cases where that may be good. There's a, there's a story a while back of a, of a gentleman who took his SAT and, and he received back and, and was told that he had scored a, you know, a 1470 on an SAT, which is, it'll get you into any school anywhere. And, and so he applied to a good college, got in, did very well in college, which amazed everybody because they, nobody really expected him to make it into you know, community college, let alone an Ivy League school. 
and, and did very well in life. And it was many years later that this man, now a successful business owner and thriving entrepreneur, finds out that there was a massive screw-up with the SAT testing and that his SAT schools were so abysmal they wouldn't have gotten him into community college. And he was sent the wrong results. Well, how would he have identified himself had he received the actual results? See, that's what we do. We get, oh, I got a poor SAT, therefore, I'm, I'm, why should I try? Why should I bother? That happens to us in so many different ways. And, but this is why Jesus explicitly taught us that our identity is not rooted in, in our pain. It's rooted in the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this message really needs to be shared with those that are suffering, those that are lonely, those that are, that, that are cut off or marginalized. We need to tell them that they are not defined by their circumstances, but they are defined by God's love. Their identity is not the problem because they're made in the image of God. However, in order to be credible, we need to believe this. <laughs> we can't just say these words. We have to believe them. We have to internalize them. We have to understand that this is a truth before we share it with others. Otherwise, we will be found out. We will become posers. We will, they will see through our hypocrisy because we really need to judge, guard against our own, our own prejudices, our own biases we all have we need to be aware of and guard against that prayerfully. We have to see past people's problems and their predicaments and to see their inherent value and worthiness of respect because they are God's child. The scripture says the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Many years ago, there's a story of a, of a renowned doctor in Paris um, uh, had a, a young man come to him complaining of depression. Just could not go on anymore. And, and the doctor tested and really did not find a, a physical reason, but he really asked some pertinent questions. And he, and he finally asked, he tells the gentleman, he said, look, there's a well-known well -known man in, in the community where you live, and his name is, is Grimaldi. And Grimaldi is, is he's a leader in the, the, the French Café Society. Um, he's well-known for, for just his, his humor, his joy. Um, he, he, he cuts this wide swath, if you will, through, through the Paris nightlife. And the doctor told the young man, he said, you know what, what you need to do is you need to go and you find this gentleman, Inter introduce yourself to Grimaldi. Let him show you how to enjoy your life in the circumstances that you're in. And, and I assure you, you will get well. And the young patient looked down and then he looked up at the doctor and he said, I am Grimaldi. See, the problem is, is that we can't, we're never going to find joy just by a nightlife scene. Um, more money, more friends. We're, we're not going to find it in ourselves. Rather, Jesus is the ultimate source of joy. He is the origin of all praise. Therefore, we, as, as Christians, we should invite others to celebrate and experience Christ with us. See, Jesus didn't, didn't only save us, he invited us into his life, into a union with Father, Son, and Spirit. He created a space for us so that we can be with him for all eternity. Similarly, we should be inviting those who, who suffer into our, into our homes, into our celebrations, into our meetings, into our worship, into our outreach activities. Any event that allows them to experience the joy that is in Jesus Christ that we experience in Christ and in each other. See, as, as we continue to celebrate Advent, let us remember that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for everyone. It's good news for all, including the poor including the broken, including those that are mired in despair. No matter the situation, Jesus is a new beginning. While the sights and the sounds and the smells of the season are wonderful and should be enjoyed, our focus should be on Christ and the message of 
hope that he brings to all humanity, the offer of joy that he holds out to each and every one of us, regardless of our circumstances. We need to spread the word that we don't have to wait for the promise of renewal. We don't have to wait for new life. Jesus has come to us. And the end of all suffering begins today. Let's pray. Great triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Words elude us as we try to express our gratitude for what you have given us through Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, the relationship we now have with you, great God. We celebrate knowing that many do not. That's not a reason, Lord, for us not to celebrate. That's a reason for us to do what we can to invite others into the celebration. Give us the, the wisdom, the opportunity, and the, and the willingness to step out into a community that really needs, desperately needs, to know you and the hope and joy and peace and love that you offer unconditionally. Let us be your hands and feet at this time of year when that need seems to be just highlighted even more. Lord, we thank you for all that you give us. Let us be an instrument to bring others into your presence and to know you as we have been called to know you. Lord Jesus, it is in your wonderful name that we pray and that we collectively say,